I call to order the Bedford Township Planning Commission regular meeting for April 26, 2023. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, Mr. Lamkowski, can you take the roll call, please? Yes, sir. Mr. Mahoney is excused. Lamkowski is here. Steiner. Aye. Andrew. Here. Ricks. Here. Helm. Here. Obrek. Here. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number four, approval of the agenda. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I would request that the amenda be a, an agenda be amended for 7A, old business. Um, Lock it up, self-storage would also like to include a determination on a change in the um, rendering of the structure. The layout of the building will remain the same. They would request to change the color of the roof and um, the, I believe the Wayne's coat and the applicant can speak further if the amend, agenda is amended. If so, um, Ms. Ingram will pass out additional information. Thank you. So at this point, looking for a motion to approve the amended agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda as amended by adding determination of siding and roof color for lock it up storage. Okay, do I hear support? I'll second. There is support. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Amended agenda is approved. Okay, moving on to item number five, uh, approval of the minutes of April 12th, 2023. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from April 12th, 2023. Do I hear support? Support. Those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those I'll opposed? As I was absent. I will abstain too, as I was absent. Minutes are approved. Item number six, public comment. This time we'll accept any public comments for items uh, that are not on the agenda this evening. Seeing that there are no public comments at this time, we'll move on to item number 7A, under old business. Request for a determination for lock it up self storage on landscaping requirements for the PUD agreement on parcel number 5802026070000. Uh, also, uh, the change in color in the roof and wainscoting uh, located at 100 Westerns Road, Temperance, Michigan. Joe, do you want to give us a summary? Sure. Um, this request is from Lock It Up Self Storage. Um, on May 25th, 2022, the Planning Commission determined the proposed request to demolish and construct a new office building was a minor amendment to the PUD with conditions. On August 24th, 2022, the Planning Commission granted final site plan approval with conditions. And per the second amendment to the PUD agreement, it states, whereas Lock It Up agrees that the existing evergreen trees along Stearns Road and Crab Road that are not in compliance with the original PUD screening requirements shall be removed and replaced per the original PUD agreement landscaping plan. Planning and Building Department met on site with Mr. Shea, which is the applicant from Tolson tonight, and discussed the required landscaping to be installed as the on-site trees have been removed. The original landscape plan requires a total of 97 blue spruce trees, eight feet in height, to be installed on a three-foot berm. Planning department supplied the applicant with the original approved landscape plan. While the berm is in existence due to the, I'm gonna probably terrify this word, Resferia needle cast disease spreading in the blue spruce trees and green giant arborvitae being a similar nature to that type of tree, the applicant is requesting a determination from the commission for permission to install green giant arborvitaes instead of blue spruce trees for the required number of trees. 
the applicant has provided via a text message with the landscaping company a rendering of the proposed trees and discussion on the deadly disease and supporting Green Giant as an excellent substitute, better providing coverage, quicker and more drought tolerant. Um, <clears throat> In this portion of the language, this is where we approved it for a minor amendment and stated that the screenings required on the original approved landscaping plan. When they approved the site plan, it was required for it to be installed as submitted. This is the second amendment to the PUD where it states that they would be um, required per the original landscaping plan. These are the um, trees that are having the needle cast disease and you can see how the tree becomes uh, the request is this type of tree a blue or that is the blue spruce and this is information provided by the applicant and this is the proposed green giant arbor body that they would like to install um, to include the 97 required trees they are not asking for a waiver from the number of trees those are the text messages regarding the request from um, the applicant and due to the cost, um, they're requesting to have to keep reinstalling the tree should they become diseased and have to be cut down. Um, this is the original landscaping plan. All highlighted in yellow is where the trees um, were existence and have been since cut down. You can see there are 22 on the south side, 32 on the east side and a total of 35 on the north side and eight in front of the detention pond for a total of 97 trees. The um, three foot berm is in existence and I believe their intent is to just to reinstall on the existing berm. Regarding the elevations, um, there was discussion um, when the plan was approved. Um, Mr. Van Tassel noted the Van Tassel construction has not been contracted to stall any additional storage units. Attorney Cancrath stated the request is to remove the current two-story building and build a new office. However, no detail on the specifications of the new building at that time had been provided. Mr. Van Tassel advised the elevations were provided. Rector advised the um, elevations are on page A3-1, which you have been provided to tonight. However, the dimensions of the new structure were not provided. Corvette questioned if the applicant would provide that information when submitting for a site plan approval, and Rector noted the dimensions would be required through the site plan approval. The plan that was submitted clearly states that the um, roof will be a metal roof of charcoal, and then if you look at the um, portion of the wall that's um, on the I'll say the south of the building, it is notated to be charcoal, and I believe those are the two requests for the change. And um, as they are shown on the plan, and the plan was approved by the commission, I advise the applicant that the only change could be made by the commission of a determination should they desire to go with the green roof to match the existing storage units, and then brown, which I believe matches the um, siding of the existing storage units. And the applicant is available to answer any further questions. Thank you, Jody. Um, before we bring up the applicant, just one clarification. So are we looking for one motion for all of this, the amended agenda, or would this be two motions? I, I would encourage two motions because it's two separate requests that they're asking just so we can keep the documentation for the applicant and for any future inquiries on the site. Very good. Thank you. At this point, is there anyone from the applicant who'd like to provide any commentary? Please state your name and address for the record, please. Could you state it again? Paul Shea. Address is 7150 Central Ave. That's in Toledo, Ohio. Thank you. I did bring samples of what we're trying to do if you guys want to see them. Sure. Absolutely. Pass them down. That's kind of what the green and then the brown and called buff is what the white would be changed to. Um, I guess a question on that, what prompted the change? Our owner. Just because our storage units are green roof and brown siding, we were just kind of trying to blend everything all in once. So.
Okay. Open the floor up for discussion. Gentlemen, any questions? Mr. Lankowski. I'm I'm just gonna speak in support of the tree switch. I haven't I haven't spec'd a blue spruce in five to six years because of needle cast in any of my designs, so and the green giant is a great replacement. So I say go right ahead there. They'll grow two to three foot a year, which the blue spruce would do probably less than a foot. It'll be better for the neighbors as well. Thank you. Mr. Steiner? I I did do a little uh, research on those two and, and read uh, the same information generally provided, you know, with some, some of the disease and everything uh, on the spruce trees. Um, I did also see an alternative tree, which was a, an emerald green, but very similar, but they don't grow as wide and as quite as fast. So I think that the, the giants are probably the best solution for them to get a quick growth and get their screening uh, growing around the facility quicker. Um, to me, this is a very minor change, nothing drastic. And again, I'd rather see that than spruces that are half brown needle because of diseases. Or they, they, a lot of them get through drought, but some of them turn brown with drought too. So I'm, I'm good with that. Any additional comments, questions? Mr. Lankowski. <laughs> I did have one other question. The stumps, I know the trees were all cut down. Are the stumps going to be ground down below grade before? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Good. I, I had the same experience with my blue spruce. I got to replace them. You know, it's sad. It's so beautiful when you watch them slowly die up. So that's a good change, I think. Jody, I, I had one question. I think you clarified it during your review. Um, so the number of trees, the plan stays the same. We're just taking the blue spruce out and putting the green giant in. Yes, they, yeah. they are still intending to make sure there are the 97 trees. And we did go over that with Mr. Shea, why uh, Mr. Kohler and I had visited the site. So I believe their intent is to make sure there are the 97 trees as provided on the plan. They just wanted to be able to change the type of tree. I agree with the comments already made. Um, you know, the whole intent back in the day was, you know, screening, and that's what the berm was for, and the blue spruce. And I think the uh, the, the replacement the giants will accomplish that. So I'm I'm uh, definitely in favor of it. So at this point, unless there's any other comments, I'm looking for a motion specific to the landscaping. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to accept the amendment for the site plan on the landscape by changing from the spruce trees to the uh, Arborvitae uh, green giants um, due to the, uh, what was it? needle cast or, right, was it disease? What's that disease called? Needle casting. Okay, needle cast disease. Um, and also, just uh, even though it was stated to make sure that all these stumps are, are ground down as well, so they're not sticking up from the berm, because I, I doubt you'll put them in on the exact same spot with the stump, but, uh, to make sure those are ground down. Thank you. Got your support. Support. OK, Mr. Fritz, support. Any further clarification? Okay, uh, Mr. Steiner? Aye. Mr. Fritz? Aye. Mr. Lamkowski? Aye. Mr. Helm? Aye. Mr. Andrews? Aye. Mr. Kovrat votes aye. Okay. Oh my gosh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why you're looking at me, buddy. Yeah, I'm just trying to do that right. All right, well done. Throw some at me next time. <laughs> That's what happens. I miss a meeting and uh, forget everything. All right. At this point, now we're moving on to the change in color um, with the roof and the wainscot. Any further comments on that? From okay, looking for any discussion here from the commission. I'll just make a quick comment. Again, this this is pretty simple. Um, I think I'd, I actually like the idea of the green roof to match the, the current buildings and the siding as well. 
uh, to bring it close to, to look like a uniform facility. I, I don't think there's anything major about this change either. Any further comments, questions? Okay, looking for a motion. I move to make a motion to approve building roof and wainscot changes as shown by the applicant. Your support? I'll support. Mr. Helm supports. Any further discussion? Mr. Lamkowski. <laughs> Please proceed. Well, Lamkowski is an aye. Helm. Aye. Steiner. Aye. Andrews. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Covret. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Okay, at this point we will move on to item number eight, uh, new business, I, item number 8A, request for a sign waiver for Smile Properties, LLC, Mark and Teresa Warren, parcel number 58-02-029-054-2, located at 7924 Secor Road, Lamberville, Michigan, 48144. Jody, can you give us a summary, please? The applicant is Teresa Warren, 7924 Secor. Sign company is Graphic Signs. Contact is Gary Harrell. Owner is Smile Properties, located at 7924 Secor Road, parcel number 5802-029-05400, PBO, within professional business office located within Lambertville Village Overlay District. The applicant is seeking to install a monument sign with 10.14 square foot of base and 33.41 square foot of signage with an overall height of five feet and to include an LED message board on a parcel located within the Lambertville Village Overlay District. Per section 1702B, Letter G states one monument sign up to 40 square feet in area and four feet in height shall be permitted on each parcel or lot within the overlay district, which shall comply to the use on that parcel or lot. Alternative freestanding signs may be approved by the Planning Commission where the intent of the overlay district is better served by such an alternative such as, but not limited to, the size and scale of the building or lot rather than through the strict interpretation of this requirement. Also, per section 419.22.1, O states no flashing, moving, osculating, or intermittent type of luminated sign or display shall be permitted in any zoning district. Therefore, a one-foot height waiver is required for the proposed sign, and should the LED message board be approved, the Planning Commission shall determine how often the message can change so not to create a safety issue by distracting passing traffic. The applicant is requesting the proposed decorative base on the top of the sign beyond the foundation base. Per section 419.22.1L states the monument sign shall be a sign where the bottom of the sign above ground is the extension of an underground foundation and the decorative structure on top of that foundation runs at least the entire width of the widest part of the sign. Therefore, the proposed LED sign requires a waiver on the requirement for the foundation of the sign to run the entire width of the widest part of the sign. The applicant has advised the proposed new sign will be installed in the same location as the existing sign. It should be noted that the sign should, that should the existing sign be within the road right of way, any corner clearance or driveway clearance, it shall be relocated to meet the requirements of the ordinance. Should the request be considered, the following waivers are required. A one foot height waiver for the monument sign, approved to allow an LED message board, and a waiver for the foundation of the sign to run the entire width of the widest part of the sign. The following shall be considered for any inclusion of the motion. All required permits shall be obtained from Bedford Township. The applicant shall continue to maintain the entire perimeter of the landscaped area of the base, no less two feet wide, growing in a healthy condition. And the sign must be located outside the road right-of-way and the corner clearance or of a driveway. Um, I just wanted to touch base. Um, the existing sign is, I believe, outside the road right-of-way, but that will have to be determined when the new sign is installed. And the proposed signage, um, I know we're discussing the sign ordinance, but this is a prime example of when I discuss the portion of the base of the sign. This allows some decorative where the pillar extends beyond the base and the base of it extends that we're looking to remove from the ordinance. However, 
It has not been amended, so that will be required. But just this is a visual so you can kind of get an example of what we're looking at when we say the widest part of the sign. It is really just that mere corner of the pillar that's extended and the bottom of the base. Um, but the overall signage is mostly the LED board. Keep in mind this is in the overlay, so it does have a more restrictive Parcels tend to be smaller, so the Planning Commission is required to um, approve anything that is not required in the overlay district. And I believe the applicant is here to, and the sign company. Okay. Thank you, Judy. At this time, anyone for the applicant who'd like to speak? Please uh, state your name and address. Uh, Jan Howard, 2090 West Temperance Road, Temperance, Michigan. I'm also the owner of Howard's Meats at the corner of Secor and Summerfield. <laughs> And I actually wanted to address the overlay district in reference to that. I think I was one of the original committee members when we did the overlay district 25 years ago or so. And I think the main objective of the overlay was to help the non-conforming businesses in that district to rebuild should they have a fire or get destroyed by a tornado or some other act. So with that being said, the other objective was to encourage small business in that overlay district. So what I understand, and I think it's being interpreted a little bit different, when we set that up, and maybe you guys uh, need a committee to go back over that, when we originally set that overlay up, it was meant for, um, so I'm a commercial business. If the house adjacent me decided to go commercial, they can do that, but they have to follow the overlay district rules. So their sign can't be what the commercial is. It was never meant for the commercial business. So if I'm zone C1, I should be allowed to follow my signage for C1. If she's zone PBO, she should be restricted to her PBO signage. Just because we're in the overlay, it's meant for others. It meant, it's meant for the non-conforming business. It's meant for uh, the businesses that want to open up adjacent a commercial business. It gives them that allowance to do so. So I just I would hope that you guys would maybe think about taking another look at the interpretation of that overlay district, because why should I be penalized? If I'm a C1 district and I go to change my sign to an LED or whatever, that I should have to make my sign smaller. I'm a C1 business. I should be allowed. And that's how we set this up. We set it up for people that were non-conforming and people to encourage small home businesses so that they could live in their house and still have a business. So that's all I wanted to say to you guys. And I mean, it really needs to have be looked at again because I think when Dwayne Tucker, when I was thinking about redoing my sign, he said, well, your sign's way too big. Well, I'm a C1. I should be allowed what I'm allowed. The house next to me, they're not zoned commercial. They're, they're uh, residential that maybe is in the overlay that should be restricted to the sign signage of the overlay. So I wish you guys would take that into consideration and think about that. Because I, too, I'm going to be changing my sign here, and then it's been there for 30 years, 30-plus 30 years. I need to upgrade. And that's the other thing. With the LED, we need to move into the modern age and maybe think about a general rule of thumb for these LED signs because that's the way everything's moving. So if you're going to look at the interpretation of that, I wish you would look at also that as well. So that's all I have to say. Yeah, thank you, Jan. And it's, it's good timing. We're talking about the, uh, the sign ordinance uh, and revising it. So I appreciate the comments. Jody? I just want to add, in the overlay districts, we have Lamberville, Samaria, and Temperance overlay. And they are their own section of the ordinance. They are not part of the zoning ordinance. Section 400.1702B is actually Lamberville Village Overlay District specific for the overlay. And it actually has a section designed as signs. And in 13A, it says all signs 
shall be subject to the requirements of Section 1922 and must meet all township sign regulations unless otherwise outlined herein. So my interpretation of that is when it's outlined that freestanding signs, one monument sign of up to 40 square feet in area and four feet in height shall be permitted on each parcel or lot within the overlay district, which shall apply to the use on that parcel or lot, alternating freestanding signs may be approved by the Planning Commission where the intent of the overlay district is better served by such an alternative sign but not limited to the size and scale of the building or lot rather than through the strict interpretation of this requirement. I believe that's interpreted as the signs and the overlay either comply with that, and if it's not specific in this section of the sign, then it refers back to the zoning ordinance of 41922 of the sign. Um, it does even define wall signs, one wall sign, 40 square feet in area, except the sign shall not exceed 80% of the width of the building, is permitted per parcel or lot within the overlay district, which shall apply to the use on that parcel or lot. The Planning Commission may allow a larger sign for unusual circumstances where the building is large or far from the front line, but only if the character of the overlay district may be preserved. They have projecting signs, canopy and awning signs that aren't actually not permitted in the zoning district, but permitted in the overlay. The overlay also allows signs to be of design and material that is compatible with in intent and character of the overlay. It allows... Um, a temporary A-frame, T-frame sign, which is not permitted in the zoning. So it does allow fl the flexibility in the overlay because the parcels tend to be smaller. And um, Ms. Howard is correct on the fact that the overlay is intended to have mixed use. It allows C1 in a residential district if it abuts another commercial. So her parcel being commercial, if the house next door determined that it wanted to change and go through building code requirements and become a commercial building, being adjacent and directly adjacent to and connected by zoning, it could change to a commercial. So there are those, but there are specific requirements in each overlay. And I think we had that um, discussion when we first started talking about signs that the overlay district is still its own zoning and requirements. It allows flexibility on the frontages. There actually are no front yard, side yard, or rear rear yard setbacks unless you're a budding multifamily or a residential and you're a commercial use. So it's its own design to allow those flexibilities of uses, C1 and C2 in a residential in the overlay where that would not be permitted in any zoning district of our community other than if you live in an overlay district. So I just wanted to give the commission some clarification on that. Um, I don't have a problem looking at this section of the ordinance, but I will have to get clarification because I believe it's designed for those parcels within it. So I believe it's not to the entire community as the zoning district is. So I think then it, we have to have some kind of public hearing, notices mailed if there's any changes in the overlay district. That's why it's its own separate district. Good clarification, Jody. Thank you for you know, explaining that. And all of us have that information Jody was just referring to in front of us. Anyone else from the applicant who'd like to speak? Name and address, please. Uh, Gary Harrell. Address is 3443 Quail Hollow Drive, Lambertville. Any statements or comments? or? Um, no, I think, you know, we did with the drawings, I think you have pretty much everything that, that, that I can show you. Um, you know, with digital, we're... <clears throat> Digital signs typically are, we try to design them in a ratio of what we call a television. So it's generally half the height as it is the length. Um, so a, a typical sign would be four by eight, three by six, that kind of, um, that kind of ratio. Um, so, you know, getting it lower, you know, you would be, and it goes in one foot increment. So I, I don't have the, the flexibility of, of dropping in an inch or two here or there. So, uh, you know, we, we are, again, a bit limited um, on, on what our capabilities are, and, and I, I brought this up in, in other um, variances. My concern is, you know, this, this four foot is a little bit of a struggle for me when we live in Michigan because it's great in the summertime, but it's just not that great in the winter. You know, if, if we get a snowfall and it's possible to get a foot and then all of a sudden you lose the bottom of your sign, it, it just... You know, that's, that's where I struggle with, with some of that. 
and again with landscaping, you know, you're very limited on what you can do with landscaping. It's it's going to have to be. I just I try to think about the overall appearance of it, uh, opposed to you know the rules of, of four foot. So before we proceed, I I just want to give you the opportunity. We are one member short, so you can defer or we can continue. No, I'd like to go ahead. Okay. Yes, Mr. Fritz. I have a question. They were saying maybe the 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 distance off the road would be different from whether it's just existing sign is what will be the do you know the elevation where the signs going to be compared with the, uh, the road I believe the ordinance reads uh, grade two, two, two foot above grade I yeah. think it is maximum of two foot but I mean where it's sitting now and where it might sit because it might have to move back what will be the height of it um, I mean, what will be the just bare ground compared to the Keep in mind, if you look at um, her existing sign, it is, I don't know if you can, I can't. It does sit a little bit. Yeah, and it is grade. just a very small, unique sign. So I right. think depending on, I guess, once you get out, they get out there to determine where the road right of way is, and she does have those larger trees out front. So I'm not sure until they get, but um, as long as they continue to work with us to make sure it's outside the road right of way. What I'm looking for, like we've done in other spots where there's a ditch there, or it's a lot lower, then we've added the yeah, distance. Yeah, and, and that, that grade where the sign currently is, is probably a couple Just feet. Yeah, it's probably Just a in driving feet. by, that's what I saw. Yeah, it, it's but definitely I didn't know she said maybe it'd be located even farther back. Yeah. Um, so. And again... I looked at it as, as her and I discussed. Um, it does appear to be outside of road right away based on the, the general um, consensus of where the uh, utility poles are. Um, so it's it's definitely on the property side of that. Um, again, we'll have to look into what the road commission, if there's any alterations in that. I, I don't know that there is that far down, but we can certainly check into that. Any place you set that, decide on, is going to be lower than the elevation of the road. At least by two feet. Right. If if we do not raise it, and, and as she was explaining, we are allowed to raise it as as much as two feet. And that's something that I believe she's interested in doing as well. And I, I would highly recommend it because it's just again going to, it'll help with the the, the height issue that we're already. We're going to turn that because I'm about not quite 12 inches off the ground. So if we raise that another two foot, that's going to dramatically help the situation that I'm concerned with. Thank you. So Gary, so you're saying that um, you're going to not quite berm it, but you're going to grade it to bring the, the soil up? Yes, about, that's that's would be our intent. Obviously, then you have to walk, watch the swale there, what little bit there is, because you can see that it's it's set for you know some drainage there to put mm, the right. water off the roadway. Um, the the LED itself, um, we've you've been in numerous meetings. I don't think we're going to have too much of an issue there. And some standard language, which obviously we're you right. know, we're working on. And then yep. and, and obviously, I, I know the rules that we've agreed um, to in the past, and there's no issues with that. So yeah. the uh, foundation with uh, again with uh, the decorative design there. Again, that's something coming up in the sign ordinance discussion as well. That to me, that's not a big big deal. Um, the the height um, again. We guess we have to look at this. This is similar to its own unique situation. Uh, so we we can't just blanket and say every situation fits this envelope. So uh, some of the discussion there with bringing that that ground up two feet. If you do that, then do we need the that one inch? I'm sorry, that one foot variance to go up. And I do understand you've got restraints too because your panels, I believe, are 12 inches. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it, was it 12 by 24 or something? Yes, like they're that? 12 by 24 exactly. So I mean, you could go 24, then you lose five inches if you don't go beyond that. Um, so I guess that's the part we we struggle with probably with that one foot. And if I may. 
Mr. Mr. Chairman. I just want to also add, because Mr. Harrell had addressed this before with the commission when we talked about the signs, and I know you'll see in the sign, you know, we're before the horse of discussing the sign ordinance, but I do want to advise that we had had discussions of increasing the size height of a one foot base and then overall height of seven feet in those commercial districts, a one foot base overall four, five feet height in the other zonings. Keep in mind this does still not affect the overlay districts, but in the zoning itself we have discussed of allowing, because um, Mr. Harold had expressed to the commission regarding snow plows and when they push the snow, you get it or even if you stay away from the sign, it still blocks the bottom of the base. So discussion has and it's in the new portion of the ordinance that we'll discuss after the meet, at the end of the meeting. But we are looking at allowing a one foot base with an overall height of the seven feet. So the sign itself then would be eight feet in height because that's tentatively basically what we've been having presented to us of an eight foot sign, one foot of a base. And, and, but what, is you, what you said previously also makes sense too because if it's not clearly defined though in the overlay, then it's going to refer back to that anyway. To the sign ordinance. Yeah. To the sign ordinance itself. Yeah. Um, One related question to that, Rick, if you don't mind. Um, looking at the um, the photo that was taken, you know, with the trees there and leaves and the existing sign, you know, if we're talking about going to, you know, another building it up two feet and then a five foot sign, to me that I'm just eyeballing it like the sign's going to be up into the current branches of the tree. Is the plan to Strip the branches um, out? No, I, don't, I, I didn't put a tape measure exactly on that sign, but that sign's pretty tall that's currently there now. Okay. So I, I think we'd be okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Continue, Rick. Sorry. No, I, I'm good there. Um, I, I didn't realize, I didn't think that sign was quite that tall, obviously. It's not one. Just Yeah. And the trees have. I mean, here again, if we can't say, oh, we're working on it, so that's why it's going to pass or not pass. Um, obviously, it's got to pass if it does based on what we define in our factual findings here. Um, again, that, that's given a little bit more clarification and definition, also knowing that that particular sign is close to seven feet. Um, as Mr. Harrell said, we're looking at these signs with the digital panels, which is part of the limitation. Um, you certainly don't want to take away, you know, and make a half size sign either. I mean, to me, that would look just as bad as a, as a tall sign. So, um, yeah, other than that, I, I think uh, just look for other comments from from the commission members. See where everybody else is on this as well. I'll I'll chime in. I mean, I, I agree with you, Rick. I think this is um, it's a nice looking sign. Um, I think it's uh, not as large as some of the other recent waivers this commission has granted. Um, so you know, I'd be hard pressed to to uh, not support it. Um, so I'm definitely in favor of uh, what's been presented here tonight. The dimming on off, you know, so dimming at sunset, if there's a motion, that's the language that we've recently included in waivers to add that. And then uh, the message changing at no less than a five second interval, I believe is also language that we've included in waiver approvals. So let's make sure if we're gonna go in that direction that we include those. Can you come up, please? Yeah. State your name and address for the record. Teresa Warren, 8153 Jackman Road. So I really, these digital signs I love, and Layman's office has them, and all these other offices, and I kind of look forward to driving down that road to say, oh my gosh, what time is it? And I think not having the flashing, you know, the changing signs and things that are like this all the time, I think it works. And I don't know if, if Layman's and all those guys are, are they down at dusk? I have talked to my neighbors just to make sure that they weren't totally freaked out about this, which they were not. I think they're dimmed. 
They're it's not dimmed. Off. So that's what I wanted to make off. sure. So yeah. It is dimmed. Just dimmed at dust, not turned off. Okay, and then we just thought we would just not have something bright, because he suggested that we not do that, and then do, you know, time and temp only. Perfect. Something like that. So, but did you guys have any questions for me specifically since I'm looking for this sign? He's, he's doing such a great job making these signs. I just can't. <laughs> I can't not do this so any any questions comments from the commission you said that the purpose of the led would just be for time and temp or what other forms oh of no 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 had? at night time it is definitely um for our patients yeah. you know actually honestly when i was telling jan the other day i have to tell patients we are right next to hls because they've got a big sign you can't even see our sign so because our Building is dark, and you know we're on that big piece of property right there, so they kind of fly right by us and come back. So it's for so that they can see us. So it pops, and I did notice that at HLS the sign is. Yeah, everybody sees their sign. <laughs> pretty big too. I mean, it's it's taller than the ordinance I think permits as well. So. And the one thing that I do encourage my customers that are especially near residential areas, and I explained to her, is a sign on is, is going to be bright, and people will adjust to that. Where people complain, where you get an issue, is if it has something bright, and then five seconds later it goes to dark. Now all of a sudden their room goes from bright to dark, bright to dark, bright to dark. I explained to her that... If you're in a, a residential area, I would suggest if it's, if you know, and again, we don't have rules on this, and, I, and I'm not going to encourage it, but I just, I try to explain to my customers that, you know, 10 o'clock, at 10 o'clock, just put something on there, whether it's time and temperature, just your name, something that doesn't move, and that stays a static sign until dawn. So that way there, the neighboring communities there, Adjust, you know, it may take them a week or so, all of a sudden they've got a new sign, but like anything else, if it was a little brighter than it was before, as long as it's that same brightness, you adjust to it. Where if it all of a sudden goes from bright to dark, bright to dark, then it becomes irritating, and, and I, don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to see that. So I encourage my, my customers to, to certainly keep that in mind. Thank you. Jody? That's all, that's all I was going to say is I wanted Ms. Warren to not... If there is a um, complaint on the sign and ordinance does come out that it's we usually get them in the first couple of weeks when a new sign is installed with the LED because it is a, a light source that people are not used to that if the ordinance makes it we just try to remind you to dim it at dusk or as she stated put a um, solid um, screen on that's not flashing or changing but um, she is allowed to have it on at dusk. I don't want her to think that we're saying that she can't, she has to turn it off. But if there is any concerns, it's usually just because it's a new light source that the residents or the, even other businesses are not used to having direct eye direction to. Yeah, that, that is, I think you know, right? It's kind of a darker area. There's not a lot of, you know, right. light. So that, it'll be an adjustment, um, but it'll be good. And people get used to it, so. All right, any further comments? Otherwise, we're looking for a motion. for foundation of the sign to run the entire width of the widest part of the sign. And after that, all requirement permits shall be obtained from Bedford Township. 
The applicant shall continue to maintain the entire perimeter landscape area of the base no less than two feet wide, growing and in healthy condition. Sign must be located outside road right of way and corner or driveway clearance. Uh, dimming at dusk and no less than five second intervals. Thank you. I hear support. Support. Mr. Fritz, sports. <coughs> Any further discussion, Rick? Um, just to add to just just to add for suggestion wise, I know we said dimming at dusk. Even though it's been discussed, but go ahead and let them know that they could also have that static uh, sign with the time, temperature, et cetera, uh, as well. Okay. Okay with the supporter? Support, yeah. Ex motion. Funding supporter. amendment yeah. accepted. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Mr. Lankowski. Helm. Aye. Fritz. Aye. Andrews. Aye. Steiner. Aye. Lamkowski is an aye. Covret. Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 8B uh, under new business. Request for a recommendation to the Township Board to purchase a new plotter for the Planning Department. Funding from the Township Improvement Revolving Fund. Jody. Yes. This is a request from my department. This will be the first request for the Planning Commission um, under the CIP. The discussion um, on the description from the Planning Commission is from the Department of the Planning Department. It's for a purchase of a new plotter. My assessment and justification, the current plotter was purchased around 2004, and that's in my discussions with the purchase company. The plotter is now having issues with printing, especially red ink, and it's creating lines behind the printed maps. Planning Department wants to continue to move forward, updating the maps and being able to print clear, legible maps, not only for the public, but for the schools and the post office who have also requested new street maps. Life expectancy is five to ten years. I'm requesting a recommendation to approve the purchase of a new plotter with funding from the Township Improvement Revolving Fund and the amount not to exceed 12000 Provided our two quotes, I was unable to obtain a third directly from HP. Planning Department is requesting to move forward with the purchase from Eastern Engineering to include a three-year extended warranty as presented. And I believe this is an essential project request from the department. Um, you will see Eastern Engineering has provided a um, purchase price um, of $9,895 with a sale price of $7,050. Freight and installation and training um, for myself and Ms. Ingram for um, scanning, copying, emailing, uh, any of the plans we have will have that capability. Um, that is $150. $516 is a full set of inks. Um, when speaking with the um, Dave, I forgot his name, um, he explained that the plotter comes with a sample set where you can do at least instant prints to make sure it's working properly, but he encourages a full set of ink, and when I did get the second quote, they encouraged the same. For a total price of $7,716 with a two-year extended warranty of $1,459, and you will see the extended warranty is standard with HP. Um, the second quote says the same price for the two-year extended warranty. Um, so that is with Eastern Engineering, and I am working with Dave Bubin, who actually is who worked with the township on the purchase price of the um, existing plotter. This one is from Brian Martinez, and it is from Source Graphics. Um, their quote for the exact same printer of a HP DesignJet T2600 malfunction printer multifunction printer. <laughs> Their quote for um, the equipment is $9,191.97. The service and the network set setup is $603. Of course, the three-year, which is a two-year extended, is $1,459. They break down each individual ink at $145. They will give us a trade-in offer of $650 
for a total price of $11,473.97. Um, my request is for $12,000 in case the recommendation is to go with source graphics. Um, planning department has worked closely with Mr. Bubin from Eastern Engineering on the plotter we have in existence should I needed parts or anything. Um, I believe that that is the option that I would like to proceed with as a recommendation. However, with the two quotes, um, I do believe the township board requires three, but I was unable to obtain a third. Um, I have an email that does state that I did reach out to them and I followed up with a phone call. It's not easy getting quotes for a purchase of this type. Um, Eastern Engineering is the only one locally that I could get in contact with to come meet with me, go over what the township needs were. Um, but having the two quotes, um, I would like a recommendation to move forward with Eastern Engineering in this budget year and purchase um, a new plotter. And I have um, a request to go onto the township board on May 2nd meeting with your recommendation. Thank you, Judy. Any comments, questions? Is it a scanner? It's a scanner, too? It, yes, it scans, copies, prints. We'll be able to email, scan in an email. Um, I think it will be very beneficial for um, working with developers and for our, working with our engineer. The county, if we need plans, they can scan to us. We'll be able to print them. Um, instead of having tons of paper, Mm -hmm. We'll be able to PDF those files and put them on a flash drive and save them for yep. and back them up on the server. So I think it will be overall. Unfortunately, the plotter we have, I've taught myself what I know on it by reading the book. <laughs> mm -hmm. So there's no one there. The training will be beneficial. We'll, mm -hmm. um, and Katrina and I are both going to be trained on it. And I would encourage even someone from one of the departments downstairs, should there be a need for someone else to utilize it, when I first came, it was a learning process. Yeah. Jody, that I mean, that call. Thank you for your effort in getting this, pulling this together. Um, you know, uh, being somewhat familiar with plotters and costs and scanners, etc. That cost is very, uh, very competitive. I would agree. I was expecting two to three times that, to be honest. Looks like I need to find a new vendor. So, <laughs> you know, I was a little nervous when I, because I know you know about them, and I was like a little nervous because I did a lot of research on them before I spoke with Dave on the type of one that I thought was beneficial. They actually have the same plotter with a two roll, but I did not think that was a necessity for the township for the needs that we can suffice with one roll of paper. Okay, thank you, Mr. Fritz. Uh, Jody, at, um, uh, between the two, you're happiest with Eastern. Yes, absolutely. They're local, more local if we need something. Um, if you read the, their, um, where he has it broke down, um, it will include all ink, 20 bound paper, print heads, labor, and parts. Service provided by Eastern Engineering includes all necessary. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not reading the right one. Eastern Engineering maintenance program includes a four-hour response time, backup printing service on all Eastern Engineering locations, regular preventative maintenance, travel charges, parts, and labor. The only thing it doesn't include with the um, warranty is the ink, print heads, paper, or maintenance cart cartridges, which um, previously there's, I don't believe any company will cover those as a warranty because they are items that are used daily when you use the plotter. So um, I think the four hour response time is definitely huge for the warranty because they are more local. And um, when we've had to order parts, um, I will say some of it, I was capable of putting both of our heads together. We figured out how to fix the problem and they would overnight the packages without charging us the overnight fees if we needed a part for the next day. So they've been very good to work with. Um, and I believe that their um, service time for four hours response time that is within the day or the next day for them to come out. Thank you. Additional comments, Rick? Um, the, the source graphics, there's clearly said trade-in and rebate. This one, it doesn't say that, but I'm assuming because it says price includes all rebates and trade. So you're probably trading in? Well... Eastern Engineering is not requiring me to trade it in, so the Township Board can then make a decision if they desire to sell that 
item to someone, it is an older, um, the determination would be then to the township board when I present it there, they could make the decision. I would encourage them to let me use up the rest of the paper, making the copies I need for in within um, the building for plans of drainage and those types of things from what we have. But um, moving forward, we could sell it outright or see the, the township board can make a decision how to move forward with that. Yeah, use, I mean, use the resource you've got until it's either dead or right. you know, and, empty. And or empty. Eastern Engineering will not, uh, are they're not encouraging, they will not take an actual trade in. But the cost difference of the $650 to the other company, they'll give you the credit. You can still do with it what you want, but it's still the cost is, it doesn't bring it down to the, close to what. It's an old, it's an old plotter. They're, they're not going to do much with it without putting a bunch of money into it either. So. Correct. Um, and then the other thing, going back to your quote situation, you are correct, the three quote minimum. Um, the township board has said do the same thing at times. You've got the backup showing that you tried to obtain that third quote. It wasn't possible. And I know you've been working on this for a long time. It's not like you just asked yesterday and said, oh, I didn't get it. So, um, yeah, I mean, this, this uh, sounds pretty reputable. And I know that when we first started talking plotter, we started, I think, around 7,500. Then we talked about nine or 10 grand and, and then 12. So it's uh, done a good job of negotiating your rate there, too. I mean, under 10,000 is a pretty good price. And, and again, it kills your warranty in, in that, too. Absolutely. And I believe even when we did it, um, included it within the CIP, moving forward, we um, upped it to 15,000. So I think we're at a good range. Um, and he, uh, I have advised both of the um, gentlemen that I spoke with on the quotes that it would be presented tonight for a recommendation, but that I wouldn't have a decision moving forward um, until the first week of May. And not because you've got money and you just say, oh, I got the money, just spend it. Is there anything else that you absolutely would need with this plotter that would make sense to put it in your purchase price up front? at this time or are we good as is? I don't believe so. And speaking with Mr. Bubin, um, I believe what we have presented is what we will need to be up and running and um, will serve for the township's needs. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Further comments, questions? If not, looking for a motion. I'll make a motion. Absolutely. I'll make a motion that we approve the purchase of a new plotter with funding from the township improvement revolving fund in the amount not to exceed the 12000 Should we include from Eastern? Yeah. I would encourage which quote that you're Absolutely. presenting to be recommended. Okay. That Eastern engineering quote is accepted. Okay, do I hear support? A second. Mr. Lamkowski. And then and just a comment, she would have the balance of the 12000 if there was something at the last minute, you know, that she wanted to buy for that, that, that would work, right? She has up to 12000 to spend. If there's something else that you missed or something. And keep in mind, it's a recommendation, so the township board can either allow the 12000 should anything, but I believe we're, I, I believe we're set at the 7716 for the total cost to then include another 1459 for the three years of the warranty. I, I was going to say... I, I think we should go with the quote number. Um, and again, if, if, if she's got something down the road, she's going to bring it back to the township board anyway for a purchase. So it, I don't even think then it would have to come back here because it's not going to be a... The only thing I was worried about was if for some reason Eastern fell off or the bid fell off or didn't work, you'd have to and she could move right to the graphic. You'd have to get a brand new approval. Even though it says... Only because we're putting in about the Eastern. If we left the Eastern out and said that she had the 12000 not to exceed. If you're going to go to the board, you better stick with naming who it is. Okay. I guess one follow-up question there is paper. Uh, the rules of paper, I mean, does this include? The set, one rule. And then as the year, to get me started, this is the quote I need to get started. Um, but once it's approved, I can budget that out of my um, budget for the year, and I disperse that within other departments that require us to make copies and plans with. So gotcha. okay. anything additional will just be just like with the plotter I have. I budget it. I use it out of my office supplies. If I order ink, if I have to order paper, it just comes out of my office supplies within my yearly budget. 
Okay. So to get the plotter and everything set up, I think what Mr. Boyven has um, provided will definitely get us up and running. I'll say Jody's budget is a tight ship, so she won't uh, she won't be asking for money if she really doesn't need it. <laughs> mm -hmm. For it just to be for the quote to go to the township board. Good. Sure, Rick. Rick, do you think we ought to put the ninety-one seventy-five? Correct. Put the cost in there. Okay. Motion. Yeah. So that would be an amendment to the original motion. So the amendment before was to add Eastern Engineering for a total of 9175. And I believe Mr. Boybin said that this quote will be, he knows what meetings I was attending, so I believe this quote will be um, granted if it, the, the board desires to move forward with it. Is that okay with the? I approve the friendly amendment. Yes. Any further discussion? Okay. Looking for a vote, Mr. Lemkowski. Uh Fritz. Yes. Kowski is a yes. Steiner. Aye. Andrews. Aye. Helm. Aye. Covert. Aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. She fell off her chair. She's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> well, she, she's got a backup job as printer, uh, printer plotter repair person. I, I can't. I can't believe that plotter made it twenty, almost twenty years. That is wow. I will say Katrina and I have done a lot of maintenance work on it ourselves and we've fixed the roller, we fixed the print we've we've done we've learned a lot of mechanics yep. of the plotter. So hopefully Rick uh, the board uh, uh, approves that when it comes to you guys. It's I'll make sure they do. Obviously well uh, way overdue. So it's been in budget discussions so I don't think there's been any any issue that going. All right, moving on to our favorite subject. <sighs> Item number 8C, discussion of sign ordinance. Okay, so planning department with Ms. met with Mr. Lampkowski and Mr. Fritz, and we did get through the entire ordinance of what we would like to start taking a look at. I would like to move this forward. Um, we're going to go through it pretty quickly tonight, and then if I have, we have any comments or then you want to discuss further, we'll go back to those sections. Um, on the proposed language, these are comments that we have discussed at the meetings, and then comments that Mr. Fritz and Mr. Lamkowski have um, advised when we met um, a couple weeks ago. Okay. So Jody, just to facilitate, because I know it's long, right, there's a lot here. Yes. You're going to walk us through just where the changes I'm are. I'm going to go through the, just the changes. Do you want us to comment? As you hit them, or are you going to fly through them all, and then we're going to come back? Okay. Let's comment as we go for, like you'll see when I get to the first, first section. Do they have this one? Yes. Okay. So okay. we're going to get, when we get to the highlighted areas, then we'll go from there and we'll get direction. Because in the beginning, we are, this is just the actual erection of signs, and um, if they're altered, the, none of this is changing in the beginning. So we get to the section of a monument sign shall be where the bottom of the sign is no less than Y. Just want clarification that the um, section, the bottom of the sign above ground is an extension of an underground foundation and decorative structure on top of the foundation that runs at least the entire width of the widest part of the sign. We are removing that and leaving the bottom of the sign above ground is no less wide than any part of the sign above ground and the decorative structure on top of the foundation is made of stone brick rock or similar nature, decorative material, or made similar made man-made man material. I think that that was something we had discussed and everybody was clear on that. We are removing letter O and replacing it with freestanding LED message board signs shall be permitted in any zoning district other than residential zoning districts unless otherwise developed as a non-residential use permitted within a residential zoning district, except for time and temperature signs that are designed to serve the public rather than advertise and which must first be approved by the planning condition. Planning commission condition upon assigned message change no less than five second intervals, Sign to dim at dusk and or be turned off. When abutting a residential zoning district, the sign must be dimmed and remain in a single message display or dusk or be turned off. And then we wanted clarification if agreed upon for abutting the residential as it's not been conditioned previously about when we've been moving forward. We've just been having them dimmed at dusk. So we wanted clarification on that. If we would like to add that, now is the time to do so. So can you clarify? Um, dimming it at dusk or leaving it as one solid mess, solid 
message at dusk instead of just dimming. We had discussed that. I think Mr. Harrell had brought it up at one meeting and then it was discussed about leaving it when it abuts a residential zoning district that it would be a single displayed message at dusk or be turned off. I, I will say if they're paying for the LED board, I'm not in favor of requiring them as a planning department to turn it off. I don't have a problem with it being turned down at dusk, dimmed at dusk, or being as a solid message. So, so that last part, Jody, you're saying either dimmed and it could still run through That's how whatever. they are right now. Being or, or, or frozen dimmed. Frozen dimmed. It's time temp. And you need clarification from us on which one of those. Or if you want to include both. When it abut, only when it abuts a residential. If they're abutting commercial and they want to, we, but we have had discussions about the flashing and the scrolling abutting a residential district, how it, sometimes it's distracting. But we just, I feel we should leave both because we have not been requiring it. But if we want to move forward and require it abutting a residential district, that it be dimmed or in, at a single message and dimmed at dusk. Only abutting residential. So it would read, sign to dim at dusk or be turned off. When abutting a residential zoning district, the sign must be dimmed and remain in a single message display at dusk. Can I make a comment? As a sign company, my suggestion is I'm not a fan of shutting a sign off because what happens is it looks like it's broken. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> two things I want to make a comment on is the dusk is a bit of a gray area because in the summertime that's great. But if you're going to make comments, we'll need you to come up because the public can't hear. Yeah. Um, my concern is the dusk is a bit of a gray area. In the wintertime, it's 5 o'clock. In the summertime, it's 10 o'clock. So I, I think it might be, a, a, if you're going to stick, I, if you're going to stick to that, I, I would maybe put a time on it versus a dusk because I, I, I can see if somebody purchased a sign and they had to shut it off or make it static at five o'clock when people are driving home, they're kind of defeating what they invested their, their money in. So that's that's the only thing I'm a little concerned with if, if you decide to vote that way on it. That would be the I mean, back. You've got, a, you've got a timer on there that you can put a timer on for automatic? It's it's all very programmable. So it, it can it can go static at I believe Layman's is static at 10 p.m. is how he sets his up, and I'm not sure if his goes dark or if he just has something on that. It's, it's dim. He always has something. It's dim. Jody, I just want to say that I'm not as a planning department. I'm not in favor of the turning it off as well. Um, but I'm also not in favor of changing the language to a time because we've approved so many of them. If we now, at a time frame of turning it down, down to dimming, an ordinance gets called, it's going to be very difficult because you've already approved that with the sign waiver. And the sign waiver stays with the sign. So I think dimming at dusk is what has been approved. I think if we make a time frame on it now, it might become an enforcement nightmare allowing LED boards. In, in have you had much of an issue? No, we have not. So. And when we've had an issue of someone calling, it's normally when the sign is first put up and it's a light source that people are not used to. When we've had a complaint, the ordinance goes out, talks to the property owner, and the, there has been no other complaints on the ones we've had. I just am afraid if we put a time frame in there now and a neighbor has a call and the ordinance looks at it and says, well, it's got to be dimmed at 5 or 10, and then we go out and the neighbor has one and then the neighbor says, well, his sign's on. I just don't want to, I don't want to create an ordinance enforcement problem with putting a specific time frame on it. And I, and I agree. I, yeah. I, I, I mean, just because we, when we, the commission, even commission members before this board um, have made the approval on an LED board, it's been dimmed at dusk, five second intervals. So I just, my concern um, when Mr. Harrell brought up the residential, I think that's something more important to look at um, for requiring it to be definitely dimmed and remain in a single message display. So that is my suggestion, what she just said, based on all this discussion, is for next to residential would be dimmed and frozen at one message. I'll throw that out for the commission. Yes. Agreed. I, I didn't hear what you said. Um, I'm... I agree with Jody. Her last statement there was uh, next to or abutting residential 
that the sign should be dimmed at dusk and frozen in one image. It's still not oscillating. It's frozen, dimmed. What, what he said, though, at dusk in, in the summertime, I mean in the wintertime, you still got the businesses open, yep. and it's 5 o'clock and dust is gone. But as Jody just said, we've the Planning Commission for years has granted waivers that have been based on dusk. Just tonight. Yes. So an enforcement of a specific time would be a nightmare. Oh, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, as long as it's programmable to go dim and still leave their message. Yeah, and I'm going to be honest, we don't get that many calls on the signs of the LED. I think people have become accustomed to them as being part of the community now, so they're um, first and foremost more aesthetically appealing than just a square-based monument sign. And this is only for the residential abutment? That it has to stay solid at dusk, yes. Okay. Everyone has to dim at dusk. All right, thank All right, you good. moving on. Thank you. Okay, so letter V, permanent non-freestanding signs shall be wall signs attached to a wall of a building. The request is to remove that such no part of the sign shall be located higher than the lowest point of the roof attached to the wall of the building where the sign is located. And then we define it as a gable roof and the different types of roof <coughs> lines. My concern is when we get into a commercial building, Dr. Lehman's office is a prime example of that. We require the roof lines to be aesthetically appealing and then we don't want them to put signs in the peaks of the roof. So I think this is where we um, need to look at it for removing that because we require, we want aesthetics on the building, but then it makes sometimes where the peaks are, they're above the roof line and then they have to come for a sign waiver. So I would like to remove that and allow them to put them in the peaks of the roof as required with the aesthetics of the building. Any comments? Looks like you're good. Okay. Uh, w, the all freestanding signs shall be landscaped around to include the perimeter two feet wide. We're proposing the language, all freestanding signs shall be landscaped by stone, mulch, or plantings around the entire perimeter of the base no less than two feet wide, and said landscaping shall be kept in a maintained, growing, and healthy condition, and a rendering to be provided with the sign permit application. And I believe that um, we determined that to actually show now that there we're allowing it not to be just plantings. They can put stone, mulch at their desires. And I don't even mind if we add et cetera as long as some type of landscaping, but that they submit that with the rendering of the sign so we can actually see there's some type of, because it's not required right now to re require um, a rendering. So Jody, I looked at that one and I have some suggested wordsmithing, I guess. Um, so when I read the first part, it says, or planting, so it's option, right? Landscaped by stone, mulch, or plantings. So it could just be stone, right? It could just be stone. So the second part of that sentence is where I got a little concerned, <clears throat> where it says, no less than two feet wide, and said landscaping shall be kept in a maintained, growing, and healthy condition. If it's stone, it's not growing, it's not healthy. And I'm open to changes of the language. So can I just suggest something? Throw Absolutely. Out there? Okay. So all freestanding signs shall be landscaped by stone, mulch, or plantings. The first part's all okay. Uh, around the entire perimeter of the base, no less than two feet wide. And here's where the revision comes. And said landscaping shall be maintained, period. A rendering illustrating the landscaping is to be provided with sign permit application. Perfect. Good. Everyone agree? Yeah. Good. Last word is better. Okay. Next section. General requirements. We're trying to downsize the sign ordinance, so we're going to make all general requirements. There shall be no such signs on a trailer, vehicle, or any other portable apparatus or on the lot or parcel. Signs shall be attached to, sitting on the ground, or a wall sign attached to a building on the lot or parcel. Nothing herein shall be construed to prevent political signs from being placed on a trailer or vehicle intended as a sign for a trailer or vehicle and not on a lot or parcel. Number two, the provisions of section 1922.1 shall apply to the signs except for paragraphs A, B, C, D, F, L, and W. And those are portions already required in the um, general requirements. Um, 
provided that a building permit shall not be required and also provided the township building code shall not accept, apply except as it may apply to temporary signs. No more than one such sign shall be allowed on any lot or parcel unless otherwise stated within this section of 419.22.2. And such signs are permitted in all zoning districts unless otherwise stated within section 419.22.2. And the general requirements of a temporary sign, those are in every section of the ordinance in a temporary sign. So we're making general requirements, all one section for all temporary signs. And real estate signs. Um, um, real, so the la uh, number, number five there, you have a question on uh, maximum size. Do you have a suggestion? Yes, determine on the si temporary signs the maximum. I'm sorry, I'm going from one page to the, oh, <laughs> I sorry. missed that. 32 square feet, um, because some of them require 32, some of them have 24. I think 32 is an average sign for a temporary sign. And I think that they should be standard in any zoning district for a temporary sign. We should not say that in a PBO, a C1, or a C2, residential signs are not permitted with temporary signs because they're not in a zoning district for a temporary sign. So um, I think all zoning districts should be permitted. There's two sections of the ordinance that say 24 square feet. And I think when we had the meeting, it was a long discussion. And we came up with majority of it is 32 square feet. So we felt going with 32 square feet over standard for all temporary signs because we're only allowing one. Okay. All right, so, 32. Yep. So in real estate signs, we're going to allow one sign. We're going to take out such signs are permitted in all zoning districts and no more than two signs shall be allowed on any lot. We're going to allow to amend to one sign. We're going to keep the remaining of the ordinance. And then number seven, we're taking out that section of the, on a trailer, parking. We put all that in the general requirements. So Jody, where, I think I might have asked this the last time we talked about it, where there's an open house or um, a house for sale with the arrow put, a sign put at the beginning or entrance of a subdivision. Where does that fall? Those would be temporary non-accessory and you cannot put them on someone else's parcel. So if it's not on your lot, you would have to have the property owner. And when it's a development, it becomes an accessory sign. And you normally, in a development, all the property owners own the op are part of the open space in a condo. And in the subdivision, it is public road right-of-way. So it's not owned by the property owner. Those would be non-accessory signs and would not be permitted. However, we don't regulate those. Right, I'm not opposed to it. I just, yeah. like, where does it fall? Non-accessory, which is not permitted. So technically those signs are not allowed per, right. per the We sign. normally don't get calls. Usually the real estate agents put them out and then pick them up on their way out after they have an open house or that type of thing. So we normally don't get calls. Majority of neighbors, I mean, we're, we're complaint-based on those. Majority of neighbors that live in a subdivision really don't want a house to remain vacant, so... We don't normally get complaints on those. I'm, so I'm a just, compliance person, so yep. like, where so does that fall, accessory. right? So does anyone have an issue with that? Think it should be somehow folded in here and spelled out or just let it? I think we'll get into too much of property ownership if we regulate it. Okay. Yep. Yeah. I think we discussed that before as well, too. So Besides an empty house, I think most people would like to sell, and hopefully that the neighbor's property goes for more money and keeps their values higher. So. Yeah. Now we're going to talk about the agricultural produce signs. Signs are permitted which advertise agricultural produce for sale. Um, we did discuss this in great depth in our discussion um, because we would like clarification on the zoning. Um, we don't actually allow commercial retail sales in residential. So the suggestion was to such signs are permitted in agricultural zoning districts, period. We're talking about agricultural produce signs. Um, and the th section three, Increase or remove the language of 100 feet. Um, I would like to remove the language and not define where it goes because some agricultural parcels are 500 feet. And if you have it 100 feet back, no one's going to see that from a road going down Erie Road or Temperance. Um, number six, remove the acreage requirement. My request, we have parcels that are less than one acre, a half acre in agricultural 
to the north of the community. Um, I would not want to restrict them because they're agriculturally zoned. They should be permitted to still have a produce stand because it's a permitted use. Moving down to number 11 and 12, all listed in the temporary general requirements. Same language. Any questions? Good. All right. Go on. Political signs. We're going to wait and meet with legal on that and get some clarification. Um, we're not sure if we can just refer to state regulations on that or if it's something we have to remove or be more specific on criteria. So that will be coming back of its own section once we get a clarification, but I would like to meet with um, Mr. Kamprath on that to get better clarification because we do have to comply with state requirements on that. And of course, we removed seven and eight general requirements. Okay, community and special event signs. Number one, such signs are permitted in all zoning districts except that special event commercial signs shall not be allowed in any residentially zoned district. We would like to add except on a lot or parcel which contains a mixed use in which the sign shall be displayed for the commercial use only. That's if we have a portion of a parcel, portion of residential. Um, in our overlay district, we have a flexibility to have mixed use. We would still like it if the residential could have commercial, but the commercial could still have um, a special event sign out front without it advertising for the residential use. Number two, no more than one such sign shall be permitted on a lot or parcel where the event will be held. We would like to remove that, and then I feel we need to address multi-unit buildings because we permit one sign per unit. We get some multi-units where the same use has four or five special event signs out and the sign becomes overpowering on the road right of way. Um, but that would be something we would prefer to have some more clarification on, um, especially with multi-unit buildings. Number three, we would like to change no such sign shall be permitted on a lot of parcel containing a dwelling unit. We would like to change it on a lot or parcel containing an LED message board. Community event and special event signs shall be advertised on the LED sign or language of shall not be permitted. The intent of the LED message board is to allow them flexibility to allow their special events to pr pr be promoted on the sign. Number six, sign shall require a building permit. Such sign shall require a building permit to be obtained yearly and a rendering and duration of the sign to be displayed to be provided to the building and planning department and the sign must be kept in good repair. Um, I think special event signs normally are commercial uses where they have them annually. They reuse the same sign. I think a yearly permit, something the commission can discuss, but that was what was discussed in our meeting of allowing a one-year sign um, for their special event, they can put it up. They have to advise us when they put it up. Um, they can do it all at one time when they're gonna have that type of event or they can um, come back in and say, we're gonna use our special event sign these dates and submit to the building and planning department. Right now, very seldom do we get anyone coming in for a special event. I think we've discussed this. Normally, it's usually places of worship that will come in. If they're doing a special event, they'll come in and get their sign. So I would like it to be maybe a yearly permit. Um, we can keep the fee the same, or we can waive the fee and not have a fee for it. So, Jody, that the yearly caught my attention. Um, signs, you know, if... if if they have multiple signs or they change the sign throughout the year, they would have to come back in, right? Or are we saying we're going to give you a yearly permit to do whatever you want with your sign? No, they would have to let us know when they're going to have the special event because we would still want to know parking. If, if it is a community event or a special event that they're having on site, um, we would like to know what the special event is. Majority of the ones we get are the same special event sign. They don't change the sign. But that could be multiple times a year, right? So saying yearly, to me, I, I, they have to come in once a year versus two, three, four, five times, whatever, if they're doing special events throughout the year. Um, is there a way to change the language there, Monica? This is just proposed. This is what we discussed in that meeting for al allowing it because right now no one comes in, like I said, except places of worship. So if we want to do it whenever there's one, they have to submit the rendering. 
that a special event permit must be obtained, rendering and duration of the sign to be displayed. Pretty much that's what we have right now. We allow them for um, four times a year, two-week increments. And I'm not in favor of that either because I think that's very restrictive. Some, place, some want to put them up two weeks before the event, leave them up the two weeks of the event, and then take them down, and then that's all they're permitted. So I'm, I'm not opposed to changing that, that every time they want to do a special event, they have to submit the rendering. Um, you can say such signs shall require a building permit, a rendering and duration of the sign to be displayed, to be provided to the planning and the building department, and the sign must be kept in good repair. So one thing about any events, you know, some, some places might not know the exact dates. So they, you know, if you get a, this annual permit, and let's just say they decided they're gonna do it in something in the spring. And just like this year, our spring has been terrible, so they decide, well, I'm not gonna do it until, I'm gonna wait till May to do this event. Are they gonna have to come back in? You gave would me- would have to at least advise that the temporary sign is going to be changed if we're going to not allow it for yearly. That, that's what I'm saying. So if they had an annual permit and they gave you dates up front that it was going to be sometime, say, you know, early April, the weather was terrible, do they have to come back and say, no, we're doing it toward the end of May now? If they have an annual permit? Right. Yeah, would they have to come back in in that scenario or no? Because you said they have to give you dates. Well, they would have to advise that the event has changed, yes, because we would be assuming that the sign would be up for this time frame to this time frame. But if you want to do, you, you want to do, uh, Fame, do keep in to mind, in I'm just you, here for guidance. You are, no, no, no. I, we're just trying I, to understand. I, 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 what we I'm don't okay. want to do well, is have people come in. Maybe Mr. Know. Fritz or Mr. Lampkowski. We talked about it in the meeting, and it was discussed to make it easier on the applicants if that's, we did a yearly. That's why I, yes. That's and I'm fine if we want to change and take out, because it just said the building permit obtained yearly and a rendering and duration of the sign. So if we want to take out the duration of the sign, do a yearly permit, I'm fine with that. If we want to say they have to come in for the permit every time they want to utilize the sign for a special event, a permit would be required. Because the one thing you can do is if, if there was a way without too much headache, if they had the sign, and obviously if they're going to, if, if they're going to advertise it with a date, they're going to have to change that anyway every year. So if there was a way that you said the sign itself is good for the year as long as that doesn't change, and then if they're gonna put dates on it, maybe then they could just change their date. They don't have to necessarily come back for a new permit. They could just change their dates accordingly. Or, you know, if it makes sense, you, know, you see some signs they have a little hanger that just, it's another strip. Say if you got a four foot wide sign and you got a, a three foot or two foot that says, here's the dates, maybe that can be added in there too. Keep in mind, they're only permitted 32 square feet because that's the temporary right. sign. So that's the maximum they can have. So if you want to make it so that they, such sign shall require a building permit and a rendering of the sign to be displayed, be provided to the building department and the planning department, I'm fine with that too. If you want it every time they're going to put up the sign. Sorry, Jody, to keep kicking this can here, but um, I'm just trying to understand. So if we, if there's a yearly permit that's issued, say I'm given a yearly permit, and I want to use that sign, as Rick was just describing, four times this year, and I just have the little insert and I change the date. Here's the event, I change the date only, I change the date only, change it. I do that four times. Do I need to come back in with a yearly permit to do that? That's I need your to decision. notify you, that's, to a township. That's going to be the Sorry. discussion that needs to happen because I, I don't know. This is just what was discussed. If we want to make it yearly and require them to come in and get a permit every time they're going to put it up, or are we going to just allow them to submit a rendering? It, it, it doesn't matter to me either way. I just want to make sure that right. we're all on the same page of what the request is going to be. If we allow a temporary sign for a special event, do we want to require a building permit with which, the which rendering right, right, each time they're going to submit? And right now, the ordinance does require a building permit. It does require a building permit. And if you read number seven, you can be have 18 hours before the event, but the event shall be moved no more than two weeks and 18 hours after the first place on the latter parcel. Two week increments, four times a year. So I think that we're very restrictive on what they can do now. So we, when we discussed it, we thought 
annually if they're putting up the same sign. Move forward with one permit for a year. If you want to require them every time they're going to put up the special event sign, then they would have to come in each time for a permit. What do we think about annually for the same sign, but if there's a different sign, you have to get another building permit? Because if you look down at number eight, it's going to say, allow for a special event sign to be a feather flag or a pennant sign. It must be kept in good repair in the time frame of 30 days or six weeks with an approval with the building permit. So are we looking at feather flags and pennant signs as temporary signs? Are we looking at them as accessory signs? This is where the language gets very sensitive because I don't, we don't want to be restrictive and more than what we are. And we want to allow them to put up their flag signs so that when you go up to number two, how many flag signs can each parcel have? Especially when it becomes a multi-unit. We allow feather flags and the pennant signs. Some locations have six from the same use in a multi-unit. Mr. Lamkowski. Our main goal when we sat down, me, Ron, and Katrina and Jody, was to simplify not only for Jody and Katrina, but the residents as well. Mm -hmm. And by requiring them not to come in every single time, it, they could, as simple as a phone call, to say we're going to place this sign between this two-week period. And then... Two months down the road, they make a phone call for the same exact thing without the pain of having to bring in and get a building permit and bring a rendering each time they want to place the sign up. So they can make a and phone pay call. one fee. They can make a phone call or send an official email. Correct. That, actually, that might even be better to make sure they, they send it in writing, whether they send it by postal mail, email. Um, so yearly permit. And providing written notification. And they, can, the they can attach that right to yeah. the building permit then. That was my understanding, correct, Jody? Absolutely. That they would notify you of the periods that they're going to have it They can up. either come in and tell us. They can send. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not hung up on the actual time frame. I would just like people to notify us. So I think a yearly permit like is getting in the right direction of at least knowing that they have temporary signs up. So if you're saying they can only do it four event. times, they, if they're going to do it four, they notify you those four times in writing, they're going to do it, and they're covered for the year. If we give them a, the sign doesn't change. Right. If you give them a yearly permit, they could do it 20 times. Right. But they have to have provide some. notification right. to the township each time. Yeah, I like that. Good? I think the signs would change. It's pertinent to like a church. And they might have to teach a Bible school one time, missionary this, special speaker. You might have four different times, four different items. And that would still be covered under the, the single. No, they would still have to show the rendering if they yeah, change they the sign the because it only is a permitted. One building permit. Yeah. And you only have to pay once for the four, correct? For a yearly. Once for a yearly sign, but if they change the sign, they need to submit. For rendering. Would that the, would that but not a new fee. Not another fee. I would say not a new fee. Correct? Right, okay, that's all I wanted to make sure. So. And keep in mind, if they have an LED board, they have to utilize the LED board, and this is not an issue then. Yeah. I mean, I'm just saying that keep in mind that special event signs, if you have an LED board, that's the purpose of the LED board. You advertise for your special events, so you would not be permitted to have additional signage. And then that eliminates a lot of the multi-units that have LED boards, their special events should be on their LED board. Okay, so then I guess number eight can actually go away if we're going to look at them all as one special event sign. I do think number nine, we need to add which, which must be maintained in good repair. Regardless of any type of sign, they should be maintained. And of course, 10 and 11 are the same sections of the ordinance now move to the general requirements. Now, F, temporary signs pending permanent signs. One sign shall be permitted as a temporary sign pending the erection of an allowable permanent sign subject to the following conditions or regulations. Such signs are permitted only in commercial or industrial zoning districts and in a residential district when, a resident, when it's being developed as a residential. I think that we should allow temporary sign when it's a residential. I think we spoke on this before. 
I'm moving into Montreal Estates and I can't find it because they don't have a temporary sign out front until they can get their permanent sign. Um, we believe that it's number four states that except that the maximum shall not exceed 24 square feet. Well, you're permitted 50 if you put a monument sign, so we feel that you should be able to have a 50, per, 50 square feet if you're putting up a temporary sign. I don't know, 24 square feet going down Stearns Road or a section line road, you're going to see that residential development um, passing by. Number five, such signs shall require a building permit. A building permit for the permanent sign in our discussion in our meeting, a building permit for the permanent sign shall be obtained and in existence prior to the authorization of the temporary sign from the planning and building department and should electrical components be involved, an electrical permit shall be required. Um, we believe that you should start the process. Your temporary sign shouldn't be something that maintains forever. You're looking to build a building. You should be able to put up your temporary sign and move forward with your commercial um, monument sign. Such sign shall be permitted for only 60 days or until the permanent sign is created, whichever is first to occur, but in any event shall be removed no more than 60 days after being placed on the lot or parcel. We would like to add some language. Should an extension be requested, purchase of the permanent sign must be provided to the Planning and Building Department and then set the length of extension by case by case. We all know sometimes you can't get a sign within 60 days. I don't think requiring that. But as long as we have documentation in the Planning and Building Department that they're moving forward with a permanent sign, I think we should allow the extension. It's not always something you can order and have in 30 days. So. Number seven, number seven, remove language as a section refers to temporary pending permanent. We've clarified that in the previous um, sections of the permanent and temporary sign. And of course, nine and 10 are the same language in the general comments. Construction signs. We would like to remove such signs are permitted in all zoning districts. And, and number three, we would like to add no more than one such sign shall be permitted on the lot or parcel where the construction activity is occurring unless such lot or parcel has dual ingress egress in which two signs may be permitted, one located in each ingress egress. If it has two entrances, we would like to allow construction signs um, on both entrances. Number five, a construction sign shall not be larger than four square feet in area. We would like to remove that. A construction sign shall not be larger than a maximum of 32 square feet in area. That's all zoning districts, whether it's a residential or a commercial. However, pending a permanent sign in a residential, you can have the 50 square feet of a temporary sign because you'd be permitted 50 square feet of a monument sign. And then number six, um, we actually have never had a concern with this. Such signs shall be moved no more than 10 days after an occupancy permit is given. The building permit lapses or the building official determines that construction activity is no longer active, whichever come, occurs first. Usually developers will lean up with their signs if it's a residential, especially if they have extensions of plats. Um, that's not an issue because it's a new plat and a new phase of the project. Um, and usually you'll see... Um, a developer that's doing an individual home will leave up their sign or even for a commercial they'll have their um, construction company will have a sign up. We've not had issues with them taking them down once construction has commenced and is um, official and the um, occupancy has been issued. Um, number seven, we would like to remove that language and number nine and ten is the same general requirements. Um, there, other temporary signs. Eight, Jody, is there an eight supposed to be there? Pardon me? There's, it goes from seven to nine to ten. Um, because we added the language in the first section, so when we're adding and changing, because we added the general requirements, so it actually changed all the... Gotcha. It must have just been an oversight. It probably was nine and ten before, and then when we changed one, two, and three, four, five... Six, seven. This should be eight and nine, but it probably was just not removed. Okay. Um, H. Other temporary signs. We would like to remove. Let me see if I have any notes. Sorry. Remove the temporary signs 
such as they're restricted to their existence, size, and time being placed on a lot of a parcel maximum extended by law. I think we, we all determined these sections, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, are all already defined in the other sections of the ordinance. If legally required, the message on the sign shall be the minimum words or symbols required by law. We don't restrict what is being said on the signs. No such sign shall be permitted where there is any other sign on the lot or parcel other than a nameplate authorized by 1922.6. Wall signs, monument signs are all the other types of signs. If legally required, such sign shall be permitted only for the minimum time period legally required. We've covered that with the yearly. Um, such signs shall not exceed four feet in height for freestanding and five square feet, but if smaller size is lawful, then the smaller size shall only be permitted. We've addressed that by allowing the 32 square feet or what is permitted by the zoning district. I states no spotlights, inflatables, large flags, greater than 24 square feet or multiple flags. This is going to be another challenging request because we know there's not too many places we don't have spotlights unless it's on a monument sign for a type of commercial use or a residential development. I think we decided to leave those that large flags greater than 24 square feet or multiple flags that we don't want spotlights shining in someone else's. Normally the lights that are on the monument signs are permitted. They're usually just reflecting off the sign. Um, but taking out the remainder of the sign for community events, special event signs in accordance with the section because we clearly define that what's permitted in that um, community event sign. And then we get to the section where once I started reading the ordinance and we had spoke about this going to the BZA, there is a ton of sections um, that we would have to amend to take it back from the BZA. And then we actually read, um, the Board of Zoning Appeals shall not have jurisdiction to grant waivers for signs as to maintain fairness and equality. And because the Planning Commission has jurisdiction to grant sign waivers in Section 419.22.4, we need to get clarification from Mr. Camprath on that because I look at it as a sign waiver and it's a variance from the ordinance, but in this section of the language that's in the sign ordinance now, it says that the BZA cannot grant sign waivers. So we're going to have to get clarification and that was something we located as we were reading and moving through the ordinance. Number four, if we're moving it back to the Planning Commission from to the BZA, Regardless, it's a $275 fee. Right now, it's $150. Um, I would like to request that the Planning Commission um, request to recommend to amend that to the actual sign waiver fee, whether it comes to the planning or the BZA, to the $275. Um, we're amending the ordinance to allow flexibility on the signs. I think that at this point, when we make the changes, that should either comply or you have to pay the fee to ask for it because we are amending it to allow flexibility. What the sign waivers we have had in the, in the past. Number five, um, allow a one foot base height in addition to the overall height permitted in the zoning district for the landscaping and maintenance purposes. You'll see we've just left everything the same. Um, in the RM, RME and mobile home park districts, we have requested to remove the 25 feet from any road right of way or drive, and I'm not 100% in favor of the 100 feet requirement from the neighboring property as well. Um, we want those locations to be as clear visible as other developments, so I'm not 100% sure why that's included, but um, that would be my suggestion is to remove that language. When you get down to the other sections, um, You'll see amend the language in a PBO and a PBO1 district to allow 50 square feet in area, and it would be not to exceed 7 feet in height with an overall 1 foot base. So in a PBO, you'd be permitted the 50 square feet as other zoning districts, and you would be permitted an overall of 8 feet in height with a 1 foot base. You would have to have a 1 foot base, and the overall sign could not be more than 7 feet. And that would be added into the highlighted areas to allow 50 square feet in area and not to exceed seven feet in height within one foot base. That would be what would be included. I think we're getting close.
And then you'll see in section 7, the following in lieu of the provisions for multi-unit exceeding the 7 feet in height. We would like to remove the 40 square feet in area for a PBO, PBO1, plus the 40 square feet of decorative structure. We would like to just include that in the design for PBO, PBO1, C1, C2, C3, I1, I2, I3, and all other commercial industrial districts, except lots or parcels exceeding 10 acres in a C2, shall be entitled to two such freestanding accessory signs, and lot or parcels in an I2 or I3 district shall be entitled to two such freestanding accessory signs. All such freestanding accessory signs shall not exceed seven feet in height for all zoning districts with a one foot overall base. So that would be allowing the 40 square feet from the PBO to move to 50 square feet. So it's equal across the board, depending on the design of the sign. Same for B, in a unit located in a parcel, multi-units, we would like to remove the section of the PBO district and all districts, be the two and a half feet in height or 50 square feet in area, 80% of the width of the unit, whichever is less for all zoning districts, and to remove the PBO exception of that. Um. <sighs> Number C, each unit or lot of parcel consisting of multi-units remove the PBO, shall be entitled to place advertising signs in the window of the units, but said unit of advertising shall not occupy more than 25% of the available window space. We would just like that to be across the board, whether you're a PBO or you're a commercial, it should be the same type of use. And then in number eight, remove the language of the seven years. And I believe the sign should either be in compliance with the ordinance or you seek a sign waiver. And eliminate the headaches of the future landowners, property owners, um, when it's not advised to them that there is a seven-year contract. Um, we've had several of them, and it's unfortunate that the new owners don't know that there's that requirement, and then they have to come in. And number nine, number letter B, we're moving the 24 square feet, moving to the 32 square feet that would be permitted as we've addressed in the entire section of the ordinance. I believe that is it. Just one thing, <laughs> numerous times we talked, you talked about the seven foot height, and then you said with the one foot base, it doesn't actually spell out, so we should probably spell that out. We will. We're just, okay. we're, we were just moving forward. I want, we want to make sure before we put the language in there and amend it that we're agreeing that we're still allowing seven foot of signage and a one foot height base variant, variant uh, approval for the actual sign. So it would be an overall eight feet because I think that's the majority of the signs we've allowed have been a one foot base. And I agree with um, in discussions with Mr. Harold that, that I think that is beneficial to the property owners to allow that flexibility of a one foot base, especially for snow removal. Mm -hmm. So Jody, you went through quite a bit there on those last six, seven, eight pages. Yes. I, mean, I there were two items that were still, I think, open. I was okay with everything that you reviewed. There were two, I think, questions. Do you want us to tackle those tonight or? If, if you want to add comments, please do so because then we can get a better, cleaner plan. When we come back the next time with the sign ordinance, um, I will have a discussion with Mr. Kamprath. We will look at the political end, sign end of it, and then we will bring back, because I have to have clear direction that that's what's going to be moving forward before we publish for the public hearing, and you make a recommendation to the township board. But I, I am very grateful for everybody's input, and this is definitely, I've found packets back from 2000 that have looked at the sign ordinance and it has not moved forward so I am very <laughs> grateful and thankful for all of you putting the work in to get this process moving forward. Yeah, so those two items, thank you Joni, yes. were the, the fee. You had 150 or 275. And and that was just because it's 275 to go to the BZA and it's right now a $150 fee to the planning commission. And your suggestion would be let's just make it a flat 275 right. just to make it consistent. Are we okay with that? Because whether it stays here or goes there, I think it's a sign waiver and it's a variation from the ordinance, so I think the fee should be the same. It doesn't require a public hearing, but that was where I, my discussion is going to the BZA is then the neighboring properties would be notified 
if there was. We can add that if that's the desire, but I think it's the desire with the language that's in there that states that the Board of Zoning Appeals shall not have jurisdiction to grant waivers for signs so to as maintain fairness and equality and because the Planning Commission has jurisdiction to grant waivers in the section. So I don't know if we want to change that, and that will be something that I'll speak with Mr. Campreth on before we come back. All right, so we're good with the 275. Two pages past that, so if you okay. want to go the other way where you had to remove the language of 25 feet yes. um, from any road, right-of-way, or drive, discuss the 100-foot uh, requirement with commission. The 100-foot requirement states that for each letter parcel, one side, which may be a wall sign or a freestanding sign, shall not exceed 5 feet in height, indicating the name of the multiple housing, elderly housing, or mobile home park development, shall be permitted and provided that no such sign shall be located closer than 100 feet to the property line in any adjacent one-family residential district. My concern with that is that the mobile home park, the RME, or the RM, the multifamily, might not be 100 feet, only 100 feet in width. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you could be 100 feet if you have a residential home next to you. Um, I think that's competing land uses, but I don't think a sign is going to be the hindering portion of that for directional purposes. If we require it 100 feet, it might be 100 feet in, and then you have to have it 25 feet in farther into the property. I think it just makes it difficult so we to should, see the sign. We should strike it. So I think we should remove the 100 feet. That's where I wanted the discussion because yeah. I feel that not all parcels are even 100. They're 100 feet in width. So if you have to be 100 feet from the neighboring property, where are you going to put a sign if it's a residential next to you? How does the commission I, I've feel? I've had to get a variance on every one of them. Yes. So that is, I, I don't know where those numbers came in at, but every time I figured it, it was right in the middle of a parking lot or literally on the building. So How do, how do we feel about striking it, the 100-foot requirement? Good. Thumbs up. Aye. Like that. And I would just, I would require the same ordinance as a commercial. Well, it, it has to be located out of the road right of way, and I think that that is, that's feasible for everybody. A developer is not whoever is building, whether it's a commercial or residential, um, multifamily, elderly housing, they're going to want the sign visible, and it makes it difficult when you have it set back into the property. So I think that no one's going to line them up so they're back-to-back -back on a property line anyways. They're going to want their development to be noticed. So I think that it's not really something, as a township, we should require 100 feet from a residential. I think we would want them to know where especially those locations are, drives are at to access the buildings. Okay. I didn't have any other observations, guys. Are you okay with everything else we went through? Can I make one suggestion that... I don't think has been discussed. I didn't hear it anyways. <clears throat> As a sign company and a designer, I struggle with, and I believe the ordinance is still this way, on the commercial uh, wall signs, a maximum height of 30 inches. Is that still correct? Two and a half feet for multi. Mm -hmm. I believe two and a half feet should remain myself because it's two and a half feet, 50 square feet of signage, or 80% of the width of a unit for multi units. Keep in mind, I'm going to use the example that we had a few months ago regarding the Zanes location. If we allow a larger sign, then it becomes above the roof line, and that wasn't the intent to move that, remove that portion of the ordinance to allow the signs to go over the roof line for a wall sign, in and, my opinion. And, and I agree with that. I, I believe there needs to be some restrictions to it. The problem that, that I have as a designer is somebody comes to me with a square logo, and, and I'll give you a prime example. Um, I, I, I'm working with Richard Kenny on the uh, Quimby sign. And if you look at that sign, it, it's small. On that building, it's small. Arby's is, I, I didn't do it, but Arby's is another prime example. It just, it proportionally does not look correct on the building. I, I, I think if we take a, 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 I'm all about a square footage limitation or the 50, you know, whatever max is out or, or the size of the building. Um, I, I think we need to put limitations on certainly not exceeding roof lines or anything like that. I don't have a problem with that. I just, 30 inches is pretty limited on some logos. And it's, if somebody's got a really long mane and they make it 30 inches, it dwarfs the company next to them that has a circle and it's only a 30 inch circle. So that's where I struggle with it. Keep in mind, it's only for multi-unit structures, two and a half feet, 80% of the width of the unit. 
multi-units are more restrictive because each unit is a different size. Sometimes they get two units, so we try to keep it uniform of the height of the sign. That's where the two and a half feet come into play, is that the signs are no taller than the neighboring sign, and then depends on the size of the unit of 80% of the width. It does become cumbersome for them, but I think it's uniform for multi-units. When you get into the um, commercial districts, you'll see that um, in a C1, for each letter parcel, one accessory wall sign not to exceed 50 square feet in area. 50 square feet in area because it's a building, a single standalone building, so they allow the flexibility of the height of the sign. But when you're looking at multi-units, majority of our multi-units have either an overhang or something of that nature that, or the unit is only so wide, we surely can't have them overcrossing into another unit of the size of the sign. What is the concept of a percent square footage of the signage potential area? So not I, think, I, I think that balances it because again, there's going to be some there's going to be some signs that are that are going to look, and I run into this all the time when I'm doing advertisements on, you know, like for instance banners for I do a ton of stuff for like baseball teams and stuff like that, and I get, you know, a handful of of different companies that I have to strategically place on there, and, and I'm always varying the size, and I use my professional abilities to 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 make them, if if I made them mathematically four inches tall. There's somebody on that banner that's that's going to get cheated, because it it it's just they're not the same size. So so that's where I'm suggesting that we we stick to a square footage. I have no problem, and if we put limitations on, just as she explained, I, I absolutely agree. Not going over a, a building, you know, roof line or anything like that. I just my concern is is you know if you've got a, a company that has a you know, a square sign or a round sign versus somebody that has a extremely long rectangular sign. When you pull into that plaza or you're going by that plaza, which generally sits back, you're not going to see that sign in comparison. That's that's my concern. So, Jody, is that something not to ask you to continue to work on this? Uh, you know, the revisions here, but maybe. A follow-up separate session to, to think about that? I just that. think that the concern is going to be if we take off the two and a half feet and just do 50 square feet in area, 80% of the width of the unit, when you have someone that can only have, say, 16 square feet, that's a very small sign because of the width of the unit. So what I don't know, I didn't communicate it. So not just limiting it to the 80% of the width, but if there's an area that the sign could be placed based just the square footage, mm -hmm. not 80% of the width, but you could have a sign that is X percent of that signage area. Well, it's 80% of the width of the unit because it's multi-unit. You also have height without saying two and a half feet. You can say 80% of the width of the unit, but I would then remove the 50 square feet. If we're not going to require a height and a width for the square footage, then I would say 80% of the width of the unit whichever because it's whichever is less if you think about it, you've got three types of signs in this case rectangular circular or square and most of them are rectangular because it's a multi-unit right but like you said if somebody's got their logo if it's a square or a circle then your square footage should come into play but that might be where a 30 inch sign may look like a dwarf sign if you put that right in the middle and you've got all these other big long signs that take up 80 feet. So do, do we look at just the square footage of those where it would allow a little bit more height? Or well, we, can't allow, we can't look at just square footage because they have to stay within their unit. You have to right. remember it's... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Stay so that's what unit. I'm saying. We have yeah, to have no. something that restricts them from... Because I'll just be honest, we've had some where... They've been overlapped, and someone else doesn't. So, so Jody, they can have to remove the sign. Can we do an eighty percent of the width and blank percent of the height, allowable height, without saying two and a half feet? You know what I mean? So we know eighty percent of the width. This is how much the yeah. sign can be. Why can't we define that? Well, eighty percent of the width. If they do eighty percent of the width, they can't go over. 
that's where I'm going to say we're going to get to where they're going to go over the roof line because right. a lot of those have the raz racers on the front right. that that's where the sign is intended to go. Some right. developers, um, the pines down here, you'll see they have that racing board across the front of theirs and it's two and a half feet because they don't want them over the roof line. So I think that if we don't restrict a height and someone comes in with a sign that's four, three foot tall, and I have to say, well, it's above the roof line, and now we've re wavered from that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm not saying we wouldn't I mean, go I above the roof line. We still have that as a limit. Right, right. That, uh, and I think that's what I think. Yeah, but we, we're, re we're planning on removing that the sign can't be above the roof line. That's already a portion of the ordinance that we're looking at taking out, is that the no sign of could be above the roof line. So if we did this that we're talking about, we'd have to go back and remove And that. add that back in. Yeah. So I'm not saying that there's not a possibility to look at something we can do for it. Um, I just don't know about, you know, 80% of the width of the unit is going to restrict them, however height they want to do it, to the size they're going to do. If you say 80% of the width of the unit and they're permitted 20 square feet, they can do a 2 foot by 10 foot sign as long as it's in their 80% of their width of their unit if they're permitted 20 square feet. So if they want to do a 20, a 15 square foot sign, they can do three foot, by, but it, maybe in this section we have to say it cannot be above the roof line in, in the multi-units. I mean, I'm just giving options, but it's something that you have to decide how you want to move forward, but the two and a half feet is pretty standard when you're looking at the front of a, um, what's that called, Brad? You know when you have the What's fascia up? on the front? What's up? Is it called fascia? <laughs> when you have that fascia on the front, majority of them are two and a half feet in height. Or three foot to give the Gary, one inch on each. Can I ask you a favor, I guess? <laughs> if there are signs, I think you mentioned Arby's is one of them, like that this would... I'm not going to use Arby's as an example because Arby's was granted a sign waiver. Okay. So we can't use Arby's because they were granted a sign waiver because they wanted two signs and they don't have two road frontages. But the planning commission at the time... I'm sorry, I shouldn't remember this stuff. The Planning Commission at the time allowed them two wall signs because traveling west on Stearns, they wanted you to be able to see the location. So yeah. that's why their signs are the size they are, because they were granted a sign waiver for two signs instead of... So uh, I'm not sure what signs... I, I, just as an example, though, when we had the Zanes, um, we determined that the two and a half feet and the square footage he was permitted was sufficient because most multi-units also either have an LED board out front and they also have a monument right. board. The city of Toledo has an ordinance that, that reads, you take your square footage area, height and length of the area that you're in, and you're, you're allowed a percentage of that dimension. So what that does is that, that basically restricts them, if you have a small area, um, you're only allowed 40% of, you're only allowed 40% of, you know, let's say 100 square feet of, of building frontage. Well, that would be 80% of the width of the unit. That would be your building frontage is you're permitted 80% or 50 square feet, whichever is less. So that's the same concept, but that's what I'm saying. Then they would have to determine, and then I think we need to add in this section of the language that it cannot be exceed but you're, you're, the roof line. You're basing it on width. The width of the, yeah. However, but the city of Toledo doesn't base it on the width. They base it on the entire surface area, height and height. So that's the difference. And that's why, that's why you don't have an issue in the city of Toledo because they can, have, they, they can allow a larger and height sign, but they're limited. Regardless, they're limited to the square footage. They, they can't. Uh, she's she's referring to eighty percent of the width, where this would be. Let's I don't remember what theirs is because there's I think it's thirty five or forty five percent of the surface sign area or the facade of the building. So Jody, what happens next? Because what I I feel like we need to have another discussion on this topic, and maybe it's just you know like a couple of us we kind of right. work through some examples here, and then maybe bring it back to the planning commission. But what's ne if we don't do that, what's next with the process? Um, we're going to downsize all the changes. I'm going to get with Mr. Campreth on those two sections of the ordinance of the going back to the BZA or can, does it have to stay at the Planning Commission level and the section of political signs. We will bring it back with the proposed language of all those changes. If someone would like to schedule a meeting to discuss these sections 
or if you have any further input, you would like to email that to me, especially regarding this Section B um, for multi-unit buildings. Um, I can look into other locations as well. Um, I would just like to keep in mind when we're looking at this that we surely don't want one sign running into another sign in a multi-unit on the facade. So I think that's why we say 80% of the width of the unit and two and a half feet in height. Um, okay, so moving basically, forward, yeah. then we will bring back the exact language that will be presented in a public hearing for your approval. Any changes at that time will need to be made. And then I will schedule a public hearing. We will publish in the paper. It will be published on the website. Um, downstairs in the um, casing and then it will come to you for a recommendation and then the next available meeting to the township board for a decision and any changes they may desire then we would then republish it in the paper with any changes and then it will we still have a road to go yeah yes <laughs> that's my takeaway so what I would uh, encourage everyone to do on the Commission here is as Jody said let her know if you have any more questions, comments, thoughts, especially on B. Um, looks like we still have a window as you're going to talk with Marty, et cetera, on some yes. of these other things that if we want to try to um, change something here regarding item B that we're looking at, you know, now's the time to think about that. So when this comes back again, you'll have feedback from Marty. You'll have cleaned this yes. all up. You have some additional revisions. We can... If we decide we want to tackle that again, uh, that would be the time to tackle this again. I would encourage any comments you have on Section B to please send them over to me via email so we can address them and I can have them available for the next meeting. Um, but I would encourage if we're going to change it and not require a height restriction on it, that we encourage language that it cannot exceed the roof line. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right, we will move on uh, to item number nine, public comment. Do we have anyone from the public who'd like to speak? We do not. Moving to item number 10, information. Jody. Thank you all. As of now, we have no meeting scheduled for the first meeting in May, which I believe is May 10th, off the top of my head. Um, I do not have any items at this point ready for that meeting. Other than that, have a good evening. Thanks, Jody. Uh, commission staff comment. We'll start with Mr. Lampkowski. No, nothing. I, I actually want to thank both of them in the audience for coming out and giving some input and giving us some info that we don't always know. It's much appreciated. Thank you. Mr. Steiner? Um, I think I, I like the... We need a clear decision when you're going to talk to Marty. Um, and if our ordinance does state we have the control over that sign waiver, to me it's almost ridiculous that BZA can do it. So I think it'd probably be best back here. And then we just have to make sure, according to the BZA bylaws, that we're not taking something out that we can't legally take out of them because they're... They're more of a judicial body than we are. So obviously Marty's going to have to tell us that. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you. Mr. Andrews. No comments. Mr. Fritz. No, Mr. Helm. Nothing for me. Thank you. I have nothing. Trina, Jody. I'm all talked out. <laughs> <laughs> you're just excited that your plotter is in process. So. <laughs> That's all you're thinking about this whole time. Plotter, plotter. Um, I have nothing. Good discussion, guys. Uh, long meeting, um, but uh, I appreciate everyone's effort in getting through that uh, full-length signed ordinance discussion. Thanks, Jody, for your efforts there, and Katrina. Um, we're making progress. We're getting there. So um, that's all I got. Everyone have a good night, and we'll talk to you guys later. Meeting is adjourned.